Hello, hello. This is Johannes Suotri from Hold Run. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I released coding video, and uh, it's time to do that today. So I've been quite busy with my uh, daily work and uh, personal application development, and uh, recently I added this new Pro Backup feature which includes a, a app image saving into the server side into KTOR framework and Docker containers. So I figured it would be a good idea to um, code that actual production server to uh, host those new functions on my KTOR server. And uh, then we'll, we're gonna deploy that into KTOR and Docker and uh, test it via the applications to post our backup file and uh, we're gonna make it possible for the user to delete that backup file and also sync that backup file into any client. So it'll be cool combination of the, uh, the to, uh, to focus on the, uh, the backend framework this time. So let's start. First, we want to ensure that uh, the the back end within the Docker container will have a persistent file system. So we need to create new volume into our Ktor project. So we can add new volume name in here. Mm, let's Ktor. That's gonna be called our identifier for that one. And then we need to give the path where we will save them through our file system. Like so. So finally, we do want to mount our volume called like so now it should identify that so when we deploy pretty much now when we deploy this docker container it's gonna create that uh, root folder server doc backup files inside that con container and it's gonna be persistent we can just destroy the docker container release totally new one and it's gonna continue using those file resources that we mounted in here into our volume as long as we are consistent and we keep on saving our let's say target files in here in the roots okay next we do want to code our three endpoint functions so in your ktor i have opened the um, uh, my roots, so you hold your roots endpoint roots in some place. This is my extension class. So first we are gonna create the post file in here. Let's just keep a text in there. So there's gonna be a bunch of roots in here for different functions. I like to give it just a simple reminders what we're dealing with. Okay, that's gonna be our first function. Now, I don't know if you use authentication, but I do. So this is not mandatory for your test project, but at least for the uh, any production projects, you need some sort of uh, authentication. So I will add authenticate in here and from my private keys, it's gonna be JSON Web Token Authentication. So you don't need to add this necessarily, but I do. So it's gonna be post function. So 
we will add so and now we need to give the endpoint URI in here. Let's call it post like up file at this point and there's gonna be ID that we do require from this with the uh, endpoint URI. We do want to get the ID from the parameters. ID. So this is fully depending on your application, what kind of identification system you will get from the client because this is going to be about uh, on the server doc application based on on if somebody has purchased a pro feature i can always use the google billing id which is unique after the uh, the the customer has actually purchased a pro version pro version so it doesn't matter if it changes the device i can always dig up that identifier from the billing library that is something I will show you probably that how to get that. So maybe if you want to build some pro features, you you're able to use that identifier as well. OK, let's continue. Always we do want to check that the ID must exist, otherwise we will not continue this post function. So I'm just going to copy paste now a logging function in here. Sorry, this is going to be call.respond. So if we don't have IDs, we say call respond bad request and uh, there's just a message included also but this really doesn't return any data at this point I'm not using file description for anything at this point so let's mark it so By the way, I have tested these functions already on my test server, so we are rebuilding actually what works. So if you don't see something unnecessary for your purposes that you see kind of a redundant or just non -ex no reason to exist, just leave them out. We'll soon get to the point that we actually will handle the file as a form data or multi-part data. We do need to use try catch at this point, so there might be exceptions in the file, file handling system. So let's add these in here. It seems we don't have IO exception. Okay. Now we're going to start receiving the multi-part data. So that's that's a good choice to send file which might be at any size. Receive multi-part. Okay. We say for each part, like, hmm, it seems my keyboard is has suspiciously changed key key orders. It it might need a reboot. I hope hope I hope that I don't get any random 
key order changes anymore. So then we need to use with context and we say spatchers.io and now we can handle all part parts from that multi part. We will detect what it is. Here I'm just assigning the file description as so. But like you can see, I'm not really doing anything. It is just suppressed. So to be honest, I have no function at all for the file description so far, but it is handled as in the KTOR examples. If in the future I would see it necessary somehow. This is the actual file in them that we are interested in. So first take care of passing the file name somehow. I always will add additional parameters, query parameters, where if it doesn't matter if I call into the post file or delete file or get file, I will always pass in that as a query parameter so we can search that specific file with a specific name because this is going to be based on file system. So we query that file name. Sorry, we are receiving that file name from, from the part data. So the, it is not necessary. When you post a multi-part file, you can actually inject that name into that multi-part file itself. So it's kind of a identical identifier. So we're fetching the name from the part data at this point. So in the post, it is not necessary actually to uh, add that file name also into query parameters. So let's continue. But if it's empty, there is no file name. We're just going to say call dot respond and we say bad request again. And we just add a message. You didn't have a file name included and we return within this context of dispatchers in here. So next we do want to make sure that we will have a file to save that content into. So first we will create a path. This will now need to reference directly into this path called serverdog backup files because this is going to be the place which is a persistent in in nature even though we delete the docker container we don't lose the data and we can redeploy a new container again which is going to continue using these same resources so now we need to create this variable in here. And I put this in a wrong place. Sorry, guys. We need to put it in here, of course. Let's add it in here. Now we are in our actual code where we are dealing with this endpoint. So 
now we want to create that path. Back up root of a system. Just give me a minute. And uh, now there can be various clients. So we need to use the ID as another path creator identifier. So in this common backup root volume, there's going to be another folder based on this client ID. And that's going to be coming from the Google billing library, which is unique to only that specific user because he has purchased the pro version. So he will have his own folder to hold the backup file and they won't get messed up. Now let's create that file. Like so now we have new file in that path. And as this is a post, if it's not directory, we will need to create that there at this, like so. At least this should already exist, but there is no client specific folder yet. So if it if the path doesn't exist, it's going to now create it for the first time. Then we do the same for the file. So if it's not a file yet, we will create that file. Create new file with that name. Okay, now we can start writing our part data into this file. So we do want to now open output stream through file output stream and we will pass in the file in here. Next, we can use the part data and say stream provider dot use and this is gonna be in stream like so and we can now copy that in stream into our output stream like so. Lastly, we will say in stream dot close and out stream dot close. So that's going to take care of uh, writing that file content that we have just passed into this file. And pretty much this can handle any size of a file at this point. So, and lastly, we are just going to make a logging function. Again, you don't need to use this necessarily. I'm just going to say in here, else log. Did I go outside? Yes, I did go outside of this when. Hmm, that's weird. Oh yeah. Like so. Now we have our logging function in here. So if you don't use any loggers in your back end, just don't do this. And finally, we need to get rid of that part data. So dot dispose like so. 
I'm just going to add my comments in here. After a while, if you don't use any comments, what this does, even though it is pretty clear, well, I get so used to leaving my comments because they just remind me what is actually happening in here. Okay, we are at this point. I need to double check when part.data we are in inside wrong curly braces in here. After when is done, we will get rid of the part dispose. Okay, now we will need to return our call if everything was success and we will do it after our for each in here. Now, this is something again, maybe you like to do this, add additional information for the response. This is voluntary. Don't do this if you don't like to do that. I'm just passing in the host IP also, but this is something you do need to respond. That the save was okay. If there was no internal server errors, file handling exceptions, etc., you do need to respond. HTTP status OK, and maybe put some message. And I'm just gonna cut off this function in my return at post because there's gonna be, if there's gonna be exception in only those cases, I will just end this root into error call respond like so in here call respond internal server error backup file upload failed and return that error message that i've been assigning since the early beginning of this endpoint in here okay it seems our first file function is ready next we do the get backup file like so. Identically, this will have authenticate. Again, this is something if you don't use any authentications, just leave it out. And this time it's going to be a get. And we'll have endpoint URI of get backup file and again always we will do require ID within the endpoint URI okay similarly as in here we do want to fetch that ID immediately so ID call parameters ID we just change return at get. Hmm. And change these messages like so. So we go through the same logics. Always first, if we get through the authenticate, check the ID that it exists. Otherwise, we will have no idea whose files we're supposed to be fetching so it's better stop the call immediately with that request then there's gonna be again the file name but this this time last time because we posted a multi-part file data we were able to pass in that actual file name within that part data but with a get method, we need to pass in the file name as a query parameter. So we can fetch it call the parameters and 
and we will have a file name key in the parameters which will hold that file name. If it's null or empty, we will again stop in here by saying return at get and we will return bad response, bad request at this point. Same backup file download fail, parameter file name is null or empty. We cannot continue the function anymore. So next we will need to add a file tool. Now you might be familiar on the um, file handlings, but I'm using custom file tools which holds a couple of functions. So let me see what we have in here. Do we have file tool? Yes. So pretty much if I need to use return any file with a name and a path, this will pretty much do that one. We will need to add this another function. So I expect you to know just a little bit how to handle files with Java file systems. So that's all I'm doing in here. So we'll be using, if I recall, let's go back to the uh, return file. Yes, that's going to be going next. Let's do this and then jump back to the file tool. So So we will instantiate our class like so. We will fetch that existing file. It should exist or it doesn't exist, but uh, let's again path and file name must exist in here. So we already do have the file name from the parameters because when we make this get call, we have in the client, for instance, in Android, we have passed in a key for a file name and a value which we get in here and then we can use that for the file identifier and now we need to search from the identical path as we have in here so we can copy paste this as the path in here so let's see just to clarify what happens inside this custom class so we are getting a dir with our path. We create null file. We check if this dir that we gave in here exists and we will list all files in that folder. If the file name is actually what we want, want to find and it is a file and there's a content, we will assign that file in here and return that file. Otherwise, we'll, we will just return null. So that's what is happening in here. So now we might have a file or it is a null. Okay, let's continue. With the file, we do want to add few headers into our response. So first we want to pass in that file name into content disposition headers. So from the KTOR framework we can fetch the uh, HTTP headers and there should be be here name content disposition like so and then we'll be using content disposition dot attachment 
with parameters with parameter and there's gonna be again content disposition parameters dot file name and then we can pass in the file name like so so this is gonna be one of our headers to be added and we need to transform this into a string okay now if the user wants to parse through the, the file response at least he can also dig up the file name from this standard content disposition header like so in here on the client side okay next again this is a custom header that i'm returning you don't need to do this i'm just gonna be adding forward four and my ip of the server so i have some additional functions to use that for you might not not might not need it at all then we will as a last check see if the file is not null so we found a file actually for that user we can say call dot response respond file and we pass in that file so the user will receive that file else we need to say backup file not found with no content it's totally up to you for instance to say bad call but i'm just returning else if there was no file respond http status code no content backup file not found okay it seems our get file endpoint root is done okay the last root endpoint will be called delete server doc backup file like so i'm just gonna copy paste my authentication method from here to make it a little bit faster again if you don't have this don't use it this is gonna be a get method again with similar philosophy that we will have endpoint uri and there's gonna be id required for that one now as you can see we do the same for the delete query we do check again identically the parameter id if it doesn't exist bad request always the same again we will need to check the file name from the query parameters so i'm copy pasting this it's identical as in the uh, the get file so from parameters with file name we do check null or empty and return bad request with some message and again return at get we will want to get our file tool class at this point and this time we do want to use the additional function of delete file so we can check the result so delete file we need to give it a path and we need to give it a file name file name we fetched from the parameters and the path will be identical always assigned to our backup root volume with that id user specific id in here so let's see what we do in here so we pass in the path and the file name first 
we do get the dir of that path if it exists. We list all files in there and if we find a name file named with our file name and it is a file, we will delete that file. Anyhow, if there was no exceptions, we return true. We deleted it or we didn't need to delete it. It was a success. Only in case of uh, exception, we, we will return false. Okay, now we will need to handle our result of a file deletion. Again, I'll be using the identical res response headers as we did in here. So I'm copy pasting these in here pretty much identically. I'm just adding content disposition and putting in the file name that we just deleted if the user client has to do something with that one. And again, my optional header to pass in the IP of this host in the in the response. Now we can check if result or else there's gonna be something else done with it. So if the file deletion was success, we just say call dot response HTTP code OK backup file delete success. Else we will say call dot response internal server error delete backup file failed. So we had an actual exception in our file handling tool. Good. Now we have our delete, we have get, and we have our post server dot backup file. Hmm. Now we are not calling these and we want to add our endpoints into our plugins and routings. So you have a collection of your route calls somewhere and here is mine. So we're gonna add a optional method to guard these backup routes and if you don't use any rate limiting you can skip this but I do so I'm gonna guard all of my endpoints including these backups with a rate limiting. So this is something again that's gonna be totally up to you and the rate limiting is totally custom method that I have built in here. So I'm not gonna go through that one in this video at least. But okay, it's gonna work. You can just call them routes directly at anywhere in your system that you want to keep them. Just trying to clarify that you don't get too messed up why I have so much additional code involved in here. Okay. So we need to have call our backup file endpoint in here. So we coded our post backup file. Okay. Then we do want to add get function in here. backup file. So we do have our get server.backup file as a part of our routing system. And finally delete. Okay. Hmm. Like so. And now we have our delete function also in here. Okay, let's double check that everything that we need for this to work is actually in place. And if it's so, we will start to building our fat jar and we're gonna deploy our Docker container into the server. 
Okay, time to build our project. And we're gonna double check that there's no mistakes. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a test start that I don't see any critical errors. It's gonna tell all about the Mongo socket exception because we don't have a running Mongo container. So that'll be fine. Otherwise, it seems good to go. Okay, let's stop that. And we go into console and we can now build our Gradlu build fat jar. That's gonna bundle everything. Okay, let's give it a second. Now I do have a Docker desktop running in here. So this is gonna be informative to see the container, the image that we're actually building in here. And then we're gonna upload it into our Docker hub. Okay, now we have in the all.jar. So next let's find, we did have a Docker Compose. Yes, we are actually building this now through this Docker Compose file. So this is how I like to do it. And uh, if you're not familiar about the environmental variables, I cannot show you my passwords and all, all the secrets. So this will involve having a secrets.env file in here. So go and see my ad another video that I did way back about how to deploy Docker uh, Gator and Docker container, because that's gonna also include how to set up your environmental variables table and use those in the docker compose configuration file also. Okay, now we're gonna build this project with our secrets.env file via docker compose. So it's gonna create docker image. We can already see that in here. Okay. Yes, we have the same ID. Now before we can upload this, we want to tag it. So let me see, there was a tag. It is not test version anymore. Therefore, we want to tag it, tag that ID into that name. So we get to upload it into Docker Hub. Okay, it is tagged and now we can upload it. My memory is not that good that I can just remember all these commands because I don't do this like various times a day. I only deploy a new container with a new cater project randomly when I have new features. So backend development, it's for me, it's not as intensive as to develop new Android app versions. Okay, we can now push th that into our Docker hub. Let's give it a second. It should inform done. Okay, there it is. Now it's time to jump into our Linux server side and deploy this project in there. We are have our view opened in, in the command prompt in our server side. Now we need to synchronize, update our 
docker compose dot yml file also in here so to deploy with docker compose file you need to have that place in your server where you're about to host so it needs few updates we have to add that volume also in there and uh, notch up the version number to match what we are for the docker image so I have my root folder docker compose and in here I can change these few things so the server actually knows the version of the image I want to use because we uploaded that into docker hub it was 0.4.3 and in our ktor service project we want to add a new volume identical as this one okay now where did you go here so let's go it's right underneath the data and files okay now this actually tells the server side also how to mount this new volume for the backup files i know that if you don't create these dedicated volumes with a dedicated name and you just you always use the volume, same name it's gonna create like a sim linked double file system and uh, be careful it, it just didn't seem to work as expected at all so always use custom name for your file types to be handled in the um, through these volumes okay now we do have identical name as also in here so we can save this one and of course also in the server side you will need to have the identical secrets.env which actually holds all these secret passwords and everything that you don't want to share publicly to keep your backend closed okay i believe we can now stop our existing server docker container and replace it with our new image based container so now we get to the critical point we want to list the running containers and we have our older 4.2 version running we do want to stop it now at this point okay i'm confident this is gonna be going through during the first time so i'm just gonna delete that container as well so the 4.2 old container is gonna be deleted like so then I'm just double checking the images okay that's the old image now we do want to run our deploy our server side docker gator project again through our docker compose so we can use the same docker compose and file and give the name of secrets.env this time we will also run it in a daemon mode so i just forgot to put the up and after that we can say in daemon mode so let's run it again okay it is pulling the latest 0.4.2 image sorry three image and maybe just maybe it is running without errors in there okay 
it is up and running and it also started the MongoDB container that it has paired in here. Good. At least it is not constantly crashing. We can double check it. Okay, it is successful already 26 seconds. Good. Now we can make the proof of concept by starting our Android simulator and we're gonna make all those calls for for the at the backup file use cases and confirm that it actually works. It is time to make the proof of concept. I have two simulators set up in here. One holding a lot of items for data set, web page, etc. It has running web socket for message testing and push notifications and the user has customized these tabs to uh, organize his items. And we have totally null content app on another device, but they do share now the common feature that the user has purchased pro version. So he can now use these additional functions like view backup, delete backup, sync backup, etc. I'm just gonna hit a password in here because this is gonna be all about encryptions to guarantee that the file we send from that other simulator is safe because there's gonna be liabilities for the uh, server service providers if someday it would be breached and um, I do want to guarantee the safety for my users like so okay now with this one i'm just gonna create the backup i have done the functions to follow up and uh, show the, the progress of how it goes so let's create the pro backup now it's gonna ask the password okay the user is gonna encrypt it locally only in the client and we start the process upload success we upload updated our local file we were able to upload it and the server backup was also updated nice now if that is true this other client sharing the same source of a user id that because he he is the same owner of the other pro version he should be now able to fully restore the state of this app in here so let's first go into settings and try to sync we have empty content locally so there's no way to restore that yet but let's try sync yes okay that was fast we went through sync through download 100 and we sync the server side and it is done today now we can actually double check the content nice fully encrypted content it is totally safe for the user to actually store something like this on the server side even though the ser server would be breached this is non-personal data no identifiers to point this to any user and uh, it is anything that could be causing troubles if he would there's going to be sensitive, sensitive personal server-side data in this configuration file, so these won't be leaked at least at this point. So that's a safe file. Okay, let's restore that now. So we do need to have the same password. We can, I know it is the same in here. We can also test it if it's not, if it's wrong, it should fail okay it said true 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 and we are good to start restoring and there we go restore not push notification restore collection tabs and the full app content as an image was restored we can start it and the cyclic tests start to run identically as it was in here we do need to kick start 
the push notification cool our server inform two connections in this socket nice everything is working fine okay so lastly but not least let's go and dive into the server side volume to see the actual file because our app is running and it seems this is nearly ready to be released as a new app version cool okay now to close this video we do want to double check the server side file that it is actually what it's supposed to be so you can see that we have encrypted content in the client device so the client can only be the one to hold the password and encrypt and decrypt that before we transfer anything into the server side so we're gonna open our docker container so you can open it with the bash command docker exec it your container name and bash so now we mounted volume of server doc backup files which is in the docker compose file which you can see in here so this is actually persistent it doesn't delete if we just wipe off our docker container so we can always keep on using those resources so let's go inside in here we do have the backup files folder we want to go inside the backup files okay we can see that there is the id this is the the purchaser id so it doesn't matter if the user owns the pro version he has paid via google store he has access to this these resources from any of the uh, client devices with this id and now we should see our backup file in here so let's double check the content so it should be identical and secure as on the right side it is so this is a save format to save users uh, uh, private data in the server nothing can be traced back to the user we won't leak anything uh, of his private information for the configuration files or any server setup because at the end of the day this is all about liabilities and uh, i think it is okay good that was all guys and uh, go go try out this server doc application it is actually a api testing application which you can just start and configure for cyclic testing and keep it in your pocket and uh, it'll alarm if your backend doesn't work nice we'll be back